Dr. Zurov has written about four books, if I'm not mistaken. And two of those books, uh, he's going to mention particularly one book he's going to be uh, speaking about, uh, about that particular, but I just want to mention two books that are of particular relevance, particularly tonight. So the one is Operation Last Chance, One Man's Quest to Bring Nazi Criminals to Justice. And he wrote this and published this in 2009. And also Our People Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust uh, is another book which he published last year in 2020. Um, you can follow Dr. Zurov on Twitter for more information. You can follow him on Twitter at capital E, capital Z, U-R-O-F-F. -F. So it's at E Zurov. So it's capital E and capital Z at E Zurov. And then also on Facebook at Ephraim Zurov. His name Ephraim Zurov on Facebook. Um, so we are pleased once again to be hosting um, Dr. Ephraim Zurov. And uh, this evening's um, presentation is titled Four Decades of Hunting Nazi War Criminals All Over the World, Successes, Failures, and Insights. So it is now 7 p.m. South African time. And I think we are still expecting a few more people, but uh, we have enough people, I think, for us to start the, 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 the webinar. Um, at, I think run about now. So I'm going to hand over to Tali Nate, who's going to uh, hand over, I mean, who's going to introduce our speaker and say a few words and then hand over to Dr. Zurov. Thank you very much, Mdu. Uh, a lot of people are still coming in. So our Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center team will let everyone in. I want to um, welcome everyone um, and, and maybe allow me one more minute. There are a lot of people in the waiting room. Let, let's just wait one minute as our team allows everyone in. All right. Just um, one minute. Yes. So as, as we wait just one more minute, um, Vanessa, could you tell us where you're joining us from? It would be nice to know where you're joining us from. And um, it would be also lovely to have other people telling us where they're joining us from. Uh, so Danny, my colleague Danny, has posted the, the, the Twitter um, handle and also the, um, for Dr. Ephraim Zurov's Twitter, Twitter page or Twitter handle where you can follow him on Twitter. And also I, I forgot to say that uh, these events, these public events and, and education events that we host, uh, whether it's private events or public events would not be possible without your support, um, uh, your continued support. So thank you very much for that. Um, my colleague, Danny is going to post a, a link on the chat that will enable you to go to a platform where you can continue to support us uh, at your own convenience um, and at your own time. And any amount is appreciated. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have Susanna Harper, our friend, Susanna Harper, who's joining us from Tashkent. And she's saying it's 43 degrees today. 43 degrees Celsius or, it, uh, I assume that must be very, very hot. In, in South Africa, we're experiencing a winter. So in Johannesburg, it's very, very cold today. Uh, I think it's like five degrees, five or six degrees today. So, um, okay. Um, I think we are ready yeah. to yes, start. Yes, um, people will still come in, but uh, <laughs> the flood is, is, is over, so it's okay. Thank you, Mdu, thank you. Um, to all of you that came from, from all over the world, from uh, South Africa, from our sister centers in Cape Town and in Durban, the three Holocaust and genocide centers in, uh, in the country. And uh, I am really thrilled to see Holocaust survivors joining us uh, and many, many friends, colleagues, uh, teachers from the different schools um, and uh, many other 
friends. Um, this is a first of a series that we would like to, to host with uh, Ephraim. Ephraim, of course, has 40 years of experience. And us at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, which is a center of memory, of education, but also of lessons for humanity, are teaching about genocide in the 20th century. We teach about the Holocaust, we teach about the genocide in Rwanda uh, that um, targeted the Tutsi population in 1994. We look at Armenia, we look at Namibia, that is again now in the news with the recognition of Germany of that genocide. And uh, what Ephraim does in the last 40 years gives us so much uh, to be able to teach and uh, learn from. So it is a wonderful partnership with you, Ephraim, to start this series of events to look at your life, at the successes, at the failures, at what can we learn about justice, uh, what can we learn about, uh, about seeking justice after genocide, and uh, we are very much looking forward to, to learn from you. So let me uh, say a few words about Dr. Ephraim Zurov. Dr. Ephraim Zurov is a Holocaust historian. He is the chief Nazi hunter of the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the director of the center's Israel office in Eastern European affairs. For four decades, he has played a major role in facilitating the prosecution of many Nazi war criminals all over the world. He is the author of four books translated into 15 languages, and you can uh, see links to his books, uh, the most recent books, uh, in our chat. He's also an author of numerous articles on Holocaust-related issues and their impact on the Jewish world. Ephraim also visited Rwanda, worked in Rwanda, and published many articles about the genocide in Rwanda. He's a recipient of many honors, and he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2008. It is a great honor to have you, Ephraim, and we look forward to hear your journey today, your journey from how did you become a Nazi hunter, and some of your stories, and next time in the series, some more stories. The Zoom floor is yours. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Tali. Uh, I want to begin by thanking you, Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, for providing me with the opportunity uh, to meet your audience and to tell them about the about the efforts over the last 40 years to help facilitate justice. But I have to say that your effusive introduction reminded me of a story about Lyndon Johnson, who was once introduced in a very glowing, glowing introduction. And his response was that his father would have found that introduction interesting, but only his mother would have believed it. In any event, <laughs> This, this lecture is an attempt to answer three questions that I'm always asked whenever I, people find out what I do. And those questions are, how did you become a Nazi hunter? What do you do as a Nazi hunter? And are there still Nazis out there to try to bring to justice? So I'll tell you three stories. The first is about someone who really, I don't think needs any introduction uh, and that's Joseph Mengele, the infamous uh, angel of death in the Auschwitz concentration camp, one of the 23 doctors who performed the selections, deciding who would be sent to work and who would be sent immediately to be murdered. But he was notorious, of course, for his pseudo-scientific experiments, uh, which he performed on camp inmates. One was to try and determine the secret of multiple births, so that Germany could make up for the population losses of World War II. And the other one was to see if he could see to it that all Aryan children would be born with Aryan racial characteristics. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a, a photograph of Joseph Mengele, a color photograph, but he had brown hair and brown eyes. He didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> In any event, uh, the story starts in 1985 when the Simon Wiesenthal Center 
sent in Los Angeles, sent a uh, request to the National Archives in the United States for any and all information about regarding Joseph Mengele. Now, at this point in time, no one knew where Mengele was. He had simply disappeared into thin air. He'd never been brought to justice. And uh, one of the documents that the Wiesenthal Center received was absolutely shocking. It was a document from a Jewish uh, American counterintelligence officer by the name of Benjamin Gorby, who informed his superior that according to an informant, Dr. Joseph Mengele had been arrested and released by the American army near Vienna in late 1946. And the letter was dated, I think, January 1947. Now, as you can imagine, this information was absolutely shocking. The Americans had Mengele, they arrested him, they let him go? I mean, it seemed absolutely outrageous. So the Wiesenthal Center made a whole scandal out of this, out of this letter. And William French Smith, who was the US Attorney General at the time, made three decisions. The United States of America will look for Joseph Mengele. Until now, there was no reason for them to do so, okay? His victims weren't Americans. His, his crimes hadn't been committed in the United States. It was obviously Germany's job to do that. They would check whether he had, might have possibly entered the United States, because by this time, it was common knowledge that thousands of Nazi war criminals posing as innocent refugees had entered the United States. And there would be a historical investigation to determine whether or not this information was actually true. Now, the historical investigation was, was uh, given over to what was called the Office of Special Investigations, OSI. And this was the office established in 1979 by the American government to handle all the cases of Nazi war criminals who were discovered living in America. And I was working for them. I worked for them from 1980 through 1986 as their sole researcher in Israel. My assignment in this investigation was to try and find the informant. They knew that his name was David Fryman. He was a Polish Jew from Lodz, and he had been deported to Auschwitz at the very end. The, the last deportations to, to Auschwitz were in September 1944, and he was sent to work in Mengele's clinic. In other words, this is a person who saw Mengele on a daily basis, and there could be no mistake about this in terms of identifying Mengele. But how do you find them? It's already 1986, 41 years after the end of World War II. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So I did most of my work uh, for, the, for the OSI at Yad Vashem, of course. And I uh, asked my friend David Silberklang, who still works at Yad Vashem today. He was the editor of Yad Vashem Studies and a senior historian at Yad Vashem and a student of my father's on top of everything else. <laughs> Uh, what, what, where would he start the, the, the search? So he recommended to me that I should look at the files of the International Tracing Service. Now, the International Tracing Service was set up immediately after World War II by the Red Cross, who were getting at millions of requests for information about people who had been living in Europe during World War II and whose fate was unknown. What happened to my father, what happened to my uncle, what happened to my grandfather, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in those days, there were no databases yet. But what the, what the Red Cross did was they set up a huge collection of index cards, more than 16, more than 16 million index cards. That doesn't mean 16 million people, because some people had more than one card. Um, and it was put on 3,600 microfilms. And this collection was held by 11 different countries. And 11 countries had copies of this collection, among them Israel. But the point was, and this is the luckiest thing that happened to me, that there was only one country in the world where there was free access to this information. And that was in Israel. In any other country, the only people who would get any answers from Arrelson, Arrelson was the name of the place where the original was. So in other words, it's sometimes referred to as also the Arrelson Collection or the International Tracing Service. The only people who could get answers from them were first degree relatives. In other words, if I wrote to them 
and I said, I want to know what happened to my grandfather or something like that, I'd get an answer in six to nine months. If I were to write to them, say, I'm working for the OSI, and would you please help me find some Nazis? They would say, go jump in the lake, basically. They wouldn't answer. And, and, and everywhere else, aside from Israel, there was no free access. So I started looking for da David Freeman. And, and the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was that it turns out that this material was organized not by a regular alphabet, but by a phonetic alphabet, which means double letters count as one letter. Okay, in other words, my name is Zuraf with two Fs at the end. So that's like one F. V and W are considered the same letter. I, J, and Y are considered the same letter. So as you can imagine, it took me about an hour to begin to understand what's going on. Now, what I found during that hour really changed my life because although there were no indications on these cards whether any of these people were Nazi war criminals, I knew that the people who had, the Nazi war criminals who had emigrated to Western democracies, United States, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, had all been refugees in the displaced persons camps and had, posing as innocent refugees, been able to emigrate to these countries. By the way, if our participants in South Africa are wondering why I didn't name South Africa, it's because South Africa was closed to immigration, to all immigration, in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And as a result, that's why there were very few Nazi war criminals, if any, who had actually succeeded in coming to South Africa, and the same for survivors of the Holocaust, by the way. In any event, I knew that, that all the Nazis who went to the Western uh, Anglo-Saxon countries had posed as innocent refugees. And um, I had other sources in which, in other words, on the identity of those people. But what these cards did have in Arrowson was the immigration destinations, the boats that they sailed on, the dates, and in the case of those who went to America, a first address. Now, this was simply unbelievable because nowhere could you find this information. But just to be sure, I made a list of 50 names of Lithuanians and Latvians whom I knew were Nazi war criminals. And I went looking for them. Within a matter of minutes, I found their immigration destinations. Most of them went to America, one or two to Australia, one or two to Canada, some stayed in Germany. Unbelievable. Now, what you have to understand is why was this so important? At this point in time, the only Anglo-Saxon country which had already decided to take legal action against Nazi war criminals living there was the United States. And they had established an office, which I was working for, and they were in the process of finding these people and prosecuting them, not for crimes, by the way, but for immigration and naturalization violations, okay? Because the crimes were committed outside the United States, the victims were not American. So they had to do what I call the Al Capone compromise. In other words, the same way that Al Capone was tried for income tax evasion, these people were tried for immigration and naturalization, and they could be stripped of their citizenship and kicked out. But Canada was investigating. They knew there was a problem. Australia was investigating. They too had been informed that there was a problem. Great Britain and New Zealand ostensibly had no idea. And it all of a sudden hit me that we here have a tool with which we can flood these countries with literally hundreds of suspects, the names of hundreds of suspects, to make sure that they could not just walk away from the problem and say it's too late, the people are too old, or, or whatever. They have to take legal actions against, against the Nazis there. And at the same time, I knew that I couldn't do that while working for the Americans. So what I did was I had worked for the Simon Wiesenthal Center from 78 to 1980 when I came to the United States to find material for my doctorate. And I went back to them and suggested to them that they open an office in Jerusalem. I promised them I could get them the goods and they, and they were willing to do so. And, as, and the good news is that as a result, Canada in 1987, 
Australia in 1989, Great Britain in 1991, all passed special laws in their parliaments to enable the prosecution on, on criminal grounds of Nazi war criminals who were in their countries. Okay, now, I suppose you're all wondering what happened with Mengele. So, it's very interesting. Once the Americans started looking for him, lo and behold, Israel joined the search, Germany joined the search, and lo and behold, after a investigation and the search was made in the offices of Hans Seidelmeier, who was a uh, high official in the Mengele family uh, concern, they discovered copious correspondence between Mengele and his family, which indicated that Joseph Mengele had died of a stroke swimming in the Atlantic Ocean near Embo, Brazil on February 7th, 1979, and was buried there under the name of Helmut Greger, which was his, which was his um, you know, false, false name. And of course, the question that I had in my mind was, God Almighty, think what would have happened had Mengele been caught. Why did they wait? until so late, why didn't they do this not in, in, uh, 19, in 86, but in 76 or 66? And imagine what an impact the trial of Joseph Mengele would have made, the whole issue of the perversion of medicine, the violation of the Hippocratic Oath, and you all understand what, what the implications were. But the bottom line is, and this is something that is, you know, we talk about failures, that's one of the, one of the words in the title of this lecture, the most important reason for the failures to bring criminal X or Y to justice was the lack of political will. Where there's no political will to prosecute Nazis, there never will be any trials. And that's the sad truth. And many countries were not willing to do it. They were afraid of the embarrassment, the bad publicity, and they all knew that all they have to do is wait it out and ignore nudniks like me or other nudniks, well-meaning nudniks, and the people would die, would spare them the expense, would spare them the, the bad publicity and the whole balagan, as we say in Israel, the whole chaos and mess that's involved in such, in such a trial. So I want to go over to the, second, to the second case, which is the case that I'm most proud of, the most important Nazi war criminal I was able to bring to justice, so fa help facilitate bring to justice. Uh, and in order to do that, I have to give you a little background on the history of the Holocaust in the, in the Balkans and especially in, in uh, Yugoslavia. In April of 1941, the Germans and the Italians occupied Yugoslavia and they cut it up into several different pieces. And one of those pieces was something called the independent state of Croatia. Now, that entity, which had never existed for a thousand, almost a thousand years, consisted of what's today Croatia, plus Bosnia Herzegovina, and a small piece of Serbia. Now, the country was turned over basically to a terror organization called the Ustasha. The Ustasha were a fascist group created in Italy in the 20s, whose goal was to overthrow the kingdom of Yugoslavia and separate the Croats from the Serbs, who they always felt were dominating them or you know, not giving them their due. And they're a terror organization. They started off with assassinations. And they, of course, identified with the, with the Nazis and with, the, with Mussolini, with Hitler and Mussolini. And as a prize, they received this country, the, this, this independent state of Croatia. The problem was, from their perspective, that this area that they received was full of the minorities that they hated. First and foremost, the Serbs. Hundreds of thousands of Serbs lived in that area. Then there's the Jews. 40,000 Jews lived there. Then there's the Roma. Tens of thousands of Roma lived there, about 20, 30, perhaps, thousand of Roma. So from the very beginning, from April 1941, the Croatians, the Ustasha, started setting up concentration camps all over their territory, to which they sent Serbs, Jews, Roma, and anti-fascist Croatians, okay? The, big, the biggest, the most notorious of these camps was a camp called Yasenovac. 
Yesenovats was located 75 miles northeast of Zagreb. It was a horrendous place. And it's sometimes referred to as a death camp, but technically it was not a death camp because there were no gas chambers or gas fans. People were murdered individually. There was not a single German or Austrian anywhere near this place. It was all run by the Ustasha and they used to carry out the most notorious murders and, and they did it in such a way as to bring as, as much pain possible imaginable to, to their victims. Okay, now, after World War II, I'm sure many of you have heard of something called the Rat Lines. Actually, there's a new book out by Philip Sands um, about the escape network set up to assist very prominent Nazi war criminals to escape. And they basically, this, uh, it was run by an Austrian bishop called Alias Hudel, who set up a series of safe houses from Austria, Germany, across the Alps to Genoa on the Italian Riviera, where these people were given false new identities, Red Cross passports, and they could choose passage either to the Middle East, to Syria or to Egypt, or to South America which was primarily Argentina, but not only Argentina. In other words, Paraguay, Chile, Bolivia, um, and of course, Brazil. Okay, now, the assistant to Alias Hudel was a Croatian bishop by the name of Kronoslav Dragonovic. And this was very important and it helps explain how, for example, Ante Pavlic, who was the head of state of the Croatian independent state of Croatia, one of the biggest mass murderers in the history of World War II, was able to escape to Buenos Aires. But he wasn't the only one. One of the commanders of Yasenovac, a man named Dinko Shakic, also escaped to Argentina. And we were able, with the help of a Argentinian journalist named Jorge Camarasa, we were able to expose him. Now, before we did this, we sent Kamarasa to Belgrade to meet some of the survivors of Yasenovac, who explained to them in a very graphic terms about the horrors of the camp, about the executions, the diseases, the horrendous, you know, murders and terror and all of that. And he goes to knock on Dinko Shakic's door with a TV crew in 98, late 1998 in Santa Teresita, 250 miles south of Buenos Aires. So he knocks on the door, Dinko Shakic comes to the door. Are you Dinko Shakic? He says, yes. You were the commandant of Yasenovats. He says, yes. Let's stop there for a minute. Normally, when Nazi war criminals are about to be identified or exposed, there's two answers. One is, it's not me, mistaken identity, or it's me, but he didn't do it. What does Dinko Shakic say? It's me and I did it. And he's had 50 years to think about it. Okay, it's not, this is not 1945. This is the, the end of the 90s. He's been out of there more than 50 years. So Kamarasa says to him, listen, I have a few questions I, I'd like to ask you. Do you mind? He says, no problem. Come sit in my living room. Okay, they sit in the living room and Kamarasa says to him, I hope you realize that Yasenovac was considered one of the worst camps in World War II and was notorious for the cruelty of the guards, the high mortality rate. So Shaka says to him, come on, you don't know what you're talking about. Every person who was in Yasenovac deserved to be there. By the way, this is all being filmed for Argentinian television. It's about to be shown that night or the next day, which ironically enough was Yom HaShoah. That was purely by accident, okay? So he says, nah, listen, every person who was in Yasenovats deserved to be in Yasenovats. And every country has penal colonies. So what's the problem? So Kamaras says, listen to me, you can't fool me. I just came from Belgrade. I met Yosef Ehrlich. I met other survivors of the horrors of Yasenovats, the high mortality rate, the tortures, the executions. Shaka says, what are you talking about? The mortality was, it was, it was regular. If I was given the choice to do this again, I would do it again. Do you know what the problem with Yasenovats was? They didn't let us finish the job. And I hope you all understand what that means. 
kill all the Serbs, all the Jews, all the gypsies, and all the Croatian anti-fascists. That's all, to, to finish the job. Okay, so what do we do with Dinko Shakic? So in theory, there might have been six countries where he could have been put on trial. Argentina, Germany, Israel, or the three countries of the Balkans, Serbia, Bosnia, or, or uh, Croatia. In other words, the, the camp itself was on the territory of Bosnia and Croatia. The, most, the biggest number of victims were Serbs. But the question we asked ourselves is who needs the lesson of Yasenovats the most? So it wasn't Serbia. In other words, if I were thinking only result, I say, send him to Belgrade. I say half jokingly, within five minutes after being convicted, he'd be hanging from the highest tree in Belgrade. But that's not the issue. The issue is who needs the lesson of Yasenovats? Everyone in Serbia knows about Yasenovats. It's, it's in the curriculum. So many people lost relatives there. The people who need this are the Croatians. But there's a problem. The leader of Croatia, the president of Croatia at this time is Franjo Tuđman, the only Western head of state who's ever denied the Holocaust. He wrote a book called The Wastelands of Historical Reality, in which he said that the Jews inflated the number of people, of the of victims of the Shoah from 1 million to 6 million, and Jews ran Yasenovites. Now, what's amazing is the fact that he fought with Tito's partisans against the Ustasha in World War II. His brother was murdered by the Ustasha, but when he became a Croatian politician, he became a, 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 a fierce ultranationalist. And he ran, he used that ticket basically to be elected. And he was elected. Now, just to give you a little idea of what we were up against, I have to tell you the following story. So since since many people here are in countries where they know about football, let me take you back to the Mondial, the World Cup of 1998, to Lyon, France, on Saturday, July 4th, 1998. Quarterfinals match between Germany and Croatia. Now, of course, if you know foot, European football or world football, you know that Germany is the best team in the world. And what's little Croatia? Less than 5 million people, but they have very good sportsmen. Anyway, I'm in Zagreb to meet with the prosecution. I'm, it's a Motzei Shabbat, Saturday night. I'm walking during the, uh, during the first half, I'm walking through the street. All of a sudden, the street shakes, literally the street shakes. I say to myself, what's going on? Is there an earthquake? No, 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 they tell me. Croatia scored a goal against Germany. Okay, the second half takes place. Croatia wins 3-0 biggest upset in world cup club history okay we want to see the celebrations we go out of the hotel standing within three minutes i see a group of seven young men marching towards me with this gigantic flag and i can't see if it's a croatian flag or a stasha flag anyway they're yelling at the top of their lungs dinko shakic dinko shakic that dinko shakic is in jail awaiting trial for mass murder he didn't score the goals for Croatia in the match, right? Why are they yelling his name? Because he's a hero. To half the people in Croatia, Dinko Šakić is a hero. Why is he a hero? Because he knew, how, he knew how to deal with Croatia's enemies. The Serbs, the Jews, the Roma, the anti-fascist Croatians, God bless them. Okay, so this is what we were up against. Anyway, the good news is that the trial was conducted in a very, very good manner. The judge was fantastic, Drazen Tripolo, who's today on the Supreme Court of Croatia. But there was some really, some, some such dramatic, dramatic testimony. I just want to tell you one, one, one story. One of the witnesses was a uh, Jew from Sarajevo, who as a teenager was uh, deported to Yasenovac along with several other boys his age. And a few days after they arrived in the camp, the following took place. The guards had murdered a whole bunch of inmates. And after they murdered them, they hacked off their arms and their legs. And they created a huge pile of body parts at the edge of the camp, was right at the Sava River. So the guards took these boys, brought them to this pile, and they stayed, ordered them now to throw the body parts into the Sava River. So Yaakov Finzi turns around to the, to the guard, to one of the guards, and says to him, 
Why are you doing this to us? So the God said, because you murdered Jesus. In other words, he knew he was a Jew. So how do you get the Senovats? You take hundreds of years of Christian anti-Semitism. You take the fascism of the Ustasha, the racism of the Nazis. That's how you get the Senovats. By the way, Yaakov Finzi testified with his back to the judges, to the, to the judges, because he was afraid that people will, will attack him if they see his face, they recognize him in the street or whatever. Now, one last, other, one other story from the trial itself. You know, at, uh, on the day of the verdict, the place was absolutely packed, but the problem was that half the people were in favor of Shakich, and half the people were against Shakich. Anyway, when the judge read out the verdict, so the place went crazy. Bedlam, like you can't believe, fist fights, spitting, you name it. Any anyway, one guy came over to me in good American English said, why don't you go back to your country and deal with the Palestinians? That was one comment. <laughs> in any event, I'm going, I'm going out, of the, out of the room and this tall, very distinguished looking gentleman stops me. And he says to me, listen, I have only one word to tell you. Chvala, in Croatian it's chvala. Chvala means thank you. Okay, okay, I, I thanked him, et cetera. But I asked, who, who is this guy? And the story emerged was the following. One of the stories that came out during the, during the uh, testimonies was the following. In April of 44, there was a breach of discipline by, by some of the inmates. And Shakic immediately calls an appell, roll call. All the inmates of their have to appear in the central square and, and their lineup, like they do it every day at night. In any event, he's walking up and down the rows and totally at random taking people out to be hung. So one of the people that he chose was a doctor, a non-Jew, a, a doctor from Montenegro named Miller Bushkowitz, who was sent to Yasenovats because he was, he was an anti-fascist. So when he was taken out of the line, he said to Shakach, listen, I'm from Montenegro and my, my tradition doesn't allow me to be hung. Shakach on the spot takes out his revolver and shoots him in the head and murders him. The guy who stopped me was his brother. And I can promise you that he never thought in a million years that Croatia will be independent, will be a democracy, and will put the murder of his brother on trial and give him the maximum sentence of 20 years. Now, this relates to one of the most important messages that I got from Simon Wiesenthal. One of the things that Mr. Wiesenthal always emphasized was our obligation to the victims and their families. And here I saw it so clearly. What a relief for, for this brother. What a relief for his family. That the person who murdered their, their beloved brother was brought to justice and was given the maximum sentence and he, and he died in prison. Thank God. Of course, there's a bit of a problem here because he, he has to be buried in, in his Ustasha uniform. He was totally unrepentant, by the way, Shakic. No, it was a notorious Ustasha. Anyway, he has to be, it was a private ceremony. He, he, was, he has to be buried in his Ustasha uniform. And the priest, a religious leader, right? A Dominican priest said the following in, in his eulogy. He said, it's true that Dinko Shakic did not observe all the 10 commandments. And you'll excuse me if I interject like thou shalt not murder. Okay, that's one of the Ten Commandments, but he's a model for Croatia. So with models like this, I mean, we're in deep trouble, obviously, but the trial did have a good effect uh, on Croatian society. But unfortunately, these things are not lasting, and we face a very serious problem of Holocaust distortion in Croatia, in Croatia as well. Okay, one last, one last story, and this is very current. It's about an investigation of crimes that took place 80 years ago, an investigation that was hampered by some very, very serious obstacles, but has been renewed several months ago. And I, the story goes like this. I'm sure many of you know that in Lithuania, Lithuania had the highest percentage of murder victims, victims Jewish victims, among the Jews who lived under the Nazi occupation. 96.4% of the 220,000 Jews who lived in Lithuania under the occupation were murdered, many of them by Lithuanians. 90% uh, of them were, sh were murdered by shooting very near their homes. 
and only 10% of the victims were actually um, sent to camps towards the, end, towards the end of the Shoah. In any event, the percentage of the murders, and the percentage of victims in the provincial towns was especially high. Almost all the survivors from Lithuania, people who had survived in the ghettos of Vilna, Kovna, Shav, Shavli or Shavlai and Panovich, and they, they were later evacuated by the Nazis as the Russians came and they had the huge uh, percentage of the victims of the survivors of the Shoah from Lithuania. In the provincial towns, it was something like 98 or 99 percent of the people were killed. Now, one of the survivors of the Kovna ghetto, an engineer by the name of Leib Kunachowski, took it upon himself to record the testimonies of the few survivors who had survived in the provincial towns. And for four years, he went initially in Lithuania and later on in the dis in displaced persons camps in, in Germany. He went from camp to camp to find the people who had survived from those places or who knew the story of those small shtetlach. And he recorded 1,684 pages of testimony in beautiful Litvish Yiddish, the, the Yiddish of Lithuania. And every page signed by himself and the, and the witness, okay? And the beauty and the importance of his collection was, unlike many testimonies that were taken in the immediate aftermath of World War II, he focused on the identity of the killers. And since these people were being killed in many cases by their neighbors, the Jews, the survivors knew who the killers were. And he, it, I went over, uh, it was the, he collected the names of 1,284 murderers, only 121 of which were known to us from other sources. But there was a problem. Leib Kunachowski was intent on publishing his collection as a book. Now we're talking now the 50s, but no one was interested. First of all, the collection itself was huge, as I explained, 1,684 pages. It was also in Yiddish, would have had to have been translated. And no one, in th those days, actually, there was relatively little interest in the Shoah. People were looking forward, they weren't looking back, they wanted to forget about the tragedies, etc. And for some reason, he was simply unable to get a publisher. Now, when I found out about this material, I was working for the Americans, for the Office of Special Investigations, and they were investigating a lot of cases of Lithuanians and Latvians, uh, Lithuanians, okay? And I knew that many of these people might have emigrated to the United States, and this way we could catch them. So I went to meet Leib Kunachowski, and I said to I explained to him what I'm doing, I explained to him who I'm working for, and he says to me, no, I'm not going to give it to you. I said, but Mr. Kunachowski, the people who turned, turned these Jews, he, he kept on saying, I did it for the Kedoshim, for the martyrs, for the holy martyrs. I said to him, but the people who turned our Jews into, into Kedoshim can be caught, we might be able to bring some of them to justice and be able to take, take in other words, see them punished. No, 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 I did it for the Kedoshim, I can't do it, I can't give it to you. It was the most frustrating experience I ever had in my life. One of, the, one of many frustrating experiences. He simply refused to turn over the information. Finally, Professor Dov Levine, a blessed memory, was able to convince him to give it to Yad Vashem, to the archives. Okay, as soon as we got the material, we immediately, I sat down with my father, whose Yiddish was his mother tongue, and we went over all the names. And as I said, we got a collection of 1,284 names. And as I said, only 121 of them appeared in other sources. So in other words, it's over 1,100 new names. Now, what I started to do was, as soon as I made this list, I immediately went to the files of the International Tracing Service to find out, because I knew already that the International Tracing Service had the immigration destinations. It was perfect, right? So I, I started looking and looking and looking. Now, among the testimonies there, there was one particularly horrific testimony about the murder of the Jews in a town called Rasein. 
Rasein is not far from Kovna, little uh, west of Kovna, and there had, it was a town with 6,000 Jews, and there were some survivors. And one of the survivors was a woman by the name of Dina Zisselflaum. And this testimony that I'm telling you about was recorded in April 4th, 1945. In other words, this is fresh. This is not something, you know, produced after 30 years. Anyway, she escaped the killers and she was hiding in a pile of hay, but one which was very close to the pit from which she said, she wrote in her, she said in her testimony that she could very clearly see two women murdering Jewish babies by smashing their heads with a huge boulders, a huge boulder, or smashing their heads together to murder them. One of them was the student K. Okay. In other words, now, it, I, there, there's a name there. Okay, there's a last name that was recorded in this testimony. Now, um, in Lithuanian, names of women reflect their marital status. In other words, in this case, I learned from her name that she was single and she belonged to a certain family that was named began with K. So I went to the files of the International Tracing Service and lo and behold, there were two sisters by this name, same last name, who emigrated to an Anglo-Saxon country, not South, not South Africa, I can tell you, okay? And both of them were the correct age who could possibly have been the student K. In other words, one was the age of a university student in 1941, and the other one was the age of a gym gymnasium student. Because in other words, it didn't say, Dina Zisselflam did not say what kind of student she was. And she also didn't give the first name, okay, which is, which, which is a problem, obviously. In any event, not long ago, about, about, I don't know, seven, eight months ago, the Wiesdorf Center began a research project in Canada uh, with the help of, of a, a researcher, a Canadian Jewish researcher by the name of Abby Korb, who was a wonderful researcher, I have to say. And uh, she found a way to identify people who had served in the Galicia SS division, which was a division of Ukrainians that participated in the murder of Jews in Ukraine. And it, many of them that emigrated, this unit had emigrated almost en masse to Canada. And she found a very, a very innovative way of discovering who, who of them is alive. Because these people, these Ukrainians, they want to be buried together. So they bought cemetery plots and they put up monuments, okay? So in case, if for example, a woman, the wife would die before her husband. So they put up the monument, okay? Giving the information of the woman who died. And on the other side, they put the name of the husband with no information. In other words, he's still alive. So Abby went to a couple of these cemeteries and went through every single grave there and was able to identify who are these Ukrainian SS men who are still alive. But, but she's a, she herself is a very experienced uh, private investigator. And she also wanted to go over some of the cases in Canada that had been investigated, but nothing had happened with them. Among them, this case of student K. And she was able to find a woman she was able to find one of the two sisters who emigrated to an Anglo-Saxon country and was still alive, 97 years old, living on her own, not far from where Abby lives. But the problem is, of course, we're not sure what the first name of the murderer is. And to, and to complicate matters even more, Rasain or Rasenai in Lithuanian is the COVID capital of Lithuania. So no one wants to go there. So now what we're doing is we're sending, we're about to send two Lithuanian Jews to, to Rasain and the surrounding area to try and find elderly Lithuanians who may remember the K family and can tell us exactly who this student K is. Now, 
I say the following. I'm not sure we're going to succeed, but I just want to say that if we do succeed, just think of this. It sends a very, very powerful message. If you smash the heads of Jewish babies, even 80 years later, we're going to come after you and make you pay for it. And that, I think, is a, is a lesson that a lot of very nasty people should learn. And it's, a, in a sense, it's a se sense of our commitment to the victims to do whatever we can to hold accountable those people who turn innocent men, women, and children into victims simply because they were Jews. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have quite a few questions, and I'm just going to um, encourage people to post your questions on the chat uh, so that we can, we can start uh, engaging with those questions. But there is a question. Uh, let me just put my earphones on. There's a question from, well, it's, it's sort of like, a, it, it's, a, it's a both a, a question and a comment. Firstly, he's complimenting you on the presentation that you've given to us. Thank you very much for that. So Peter Cassell is saying, your memory and recounting of names, places, and dates is absolutely outstanding. What was your immediate connection to Shakish? Okay. I had no personal connection, obviously, to Dinko Shakish, but we were able to find him and uh, we tried very hard to bring him to justice in view of the very important role that he played in mass murder and in, a, in an attempt to teach Croatian society, a society in which there's very strong nostalgia for the Ustasha among certain elements. There's also the opposite. There's also anti-fascists in Croatia. But uh, a, a large percentage of the people there are still infected, I would say, with fascism. And uh, we wanted to basically to be able to focus on that. And uh, some of the things that happened in Croatia after the trial were, for example, there was a famous, very central square in Zagreb, the capital of Croatia, which had been named by the communists to the victims of fascism. And when Croatia became independent, they changed the name to the Heroes of Croatia. So we were able to get them to change the name back to the victims of fascism. There was a street in split Croatia, which was named for Mila Budic. Mila Budic was the deputy prime minister of Croatia and the minister of education, and uh, also a fanatic with Stasha, and that name was changed. So there were, there were things that, concrete things that took place. But to say that uh, we were able to you know, fin sort of obliterate Ustashism, I can't say that. The most popular singer in Croatia today is still a man, Marko Perkovic, who is a, uh, his nickname is Thompson, who is an outright fascist, who sings openly about Yasenovac, Stara Gradishka, that's the women's camp of Yasenovac, horrible songs. And uh, when, when the Croatian national team, which came in second now in the last Mondial, uh, was was um, honored by a huge gathering in, uh, in Zagreb, in the center of Zagreb, at which there was not supposed to be any performers and any politicians. Somehow they got, he, the team itself asked him to come sing with them. And they sang some nationalist song. So this, this is a, a, a big, big struggle that we're fighting against in Eastern Europe, throughout Eastern Europe. It's a problem that affects every single country in Eastern Europe. Mm. And Tali is, is asking something to that effect. So she's asking, after the trial in Croatia, did the education system there change? And do they teach about the trial and Jasa Novak in schools in Croatia today? Excellent question. Several years after, after the trial, they did a renovation of the exhibition at Jasenovac. And I was, I was uh, invited uh, to, the, to the opening, I was there. And the saddest thing for me was, first of all, they did, they did almost nothing 
about the Ustasha. That is, they spoke about the Ustasha, but they didn't explain who the Ustasha were and what they wanted. There wasn't a single photograph of any of the five commanders of Yasenovites. And not one word about the best thing that Croatia had ever done since it became democratic, the trial of Dinko Shakic. Not one word. The, the thing they could be most proud of, not a word about it. So th this is a problem. It, this is a serious, serious problem. Very serious. And we're trying to fight it. And one of the ways of fighting it is, of course, trials. But since there's little or no political will in Eastern Europe to bring these people to justice, we're up against a brick wall, which is why now we write books. For example, the, my book about uh, Lithuania is a book exposing the lies of the government, exposing the false narrative that they created. And it's a book that, thank God, was a bestseller in Lithuania, sold 20,000 copies, 100,000 people read it. And this is the beginning uh, to create a group of locals who will help us, uh, as will join forces with, to defeat the lies. Mm. And Claredwin is asking an interesting question. Uh, she uh, asking, what up, what up, what would be an appropriate punishment be for a 97-year-old baby killer if found and convicted? Okay, so Canada has a horrible record in terms of prosecution of Nazis, and it's the only country in the world where an, a Nazi war criminal whose only defense was I was only following orders has been exonerated. In other words, in no country in the world was that was so superior orders, the superior orders defense ever accepted, only in Canada. So Canada was forced to switch to the American system of immigration and naturalization violations. And they've done a pretty, pretty miserable job. So I don't expect this woman, let's assume that the woman living in living there will be put on trial. I don't think that's the case, but I wanna tell you something. For these people, for these Nazis, the worst thing is not necessarily a trial, but the fact that their past is revealed to their families. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story in that regard of a case that we're gonna talk about in one of the next lectures, the case of Charles Zente. Okay, he was, uh, he was accused and there was abundant evidence that he had caught a Jewish boy on a tram in Budapest without the yellow star and he took him to his barracks. He was an NCO in the Hungarian army and he murdered him together with two accomplices and threw his body in the Danube. In any event, we exposed him through our Operation Last Chance. That's a program where we offer money in return for information. And uh, we found him that's a whole story I'll tell you in great detail in another lecture, but, but, um, but we didn't know what his state of health was. So what we did was we made a deal with Channel 9 Australia. We gave them the address of this Charles Zente, and they did a stakeout. So they're waiting there with the cameras. Sure enough, Zente gets out of the house, gets into his car, and drives away. So obviously he's healthy. Hallelujah. Okay. Then he comes back, and they interview him. And he's about, to be, he's about to be exposed on national television. So at the end of the interview, he denied, he denied it. He said he left Budapest a day earlier, but there's no proof, et cetera. So they asked him, Channel 9 asked him at the end of the interview, is there anything else you want to say? And remember, he's about to be exposed on national television. He said, yes, don't tell my family. Ooh. Wow, interesting. Um, well, there's a question from Susanna Harper, but Tali has, has sort of weighed in on it. She was asking, what was the name of the historian who recently published a book on the red line? And Philip Sands. Philip Sands. And then yeah. she, yeah, and then she has a follow-up question. She's saying, uh, what is the name of the detective who identified SS members with the help of grave stones? And has she published any books I could look for? Do you have Not yet. The book will be published. It's not, it's not out yet. <laughs> okay, and then um, Peter has a, has a follow-up sort of question or, or comment saying, please mention Ephraim's book. Uh, so he's asking about your book written so many years ago for his doctorate thesis that is still quoted to this day. Okay, so the book on my doctorate was the response of Orthodox Jewry in the United States to the Holocaust. The activities of the Vadaat Salah Rescue Committee, 1939-1945. And it's the history of a, 
a rescue committee set up by a group of rabbis in the United States, initially to save only rabbis and yeshiva students, later expanded to save anybody, any, any Jew, uh, any people, victims of Nazis. Um, and eventually they ultimately actually negotiated with the Nazis at the end of the war. They were able to get a train load of 1,210 people out of Theresienstadt concentration camp to Switzerland. And uh, they also helped save some quite a few hundred rabbis and yeshiva students. It's a very complicated story. If Tali wants me to tell the story, I'll, I'll come on a different occasion to tell it to you. It's absolutely fascinating, infuriating, and frustrating. All right. And then we have another question from Solomon, who's asking, Dear Ephraim, what is your opinion on the whitewashing of the Nazi accomplices in Eastern Europe done by the governments in our countries? So that is probably by my friend Solomon Bali from Bulgaria. Yes. And he's 100% right. This is a problem, as I said, that is endemic to the entire region, to all the post-communist regimes. And I'll give you an example from Bulgaria. The Bulgarians in Bulgaria, the Jews of Bulgaria, the Jewish citizens of Bulgaria were saved by a combination of circumstances, help from Dmitry Pishev, the deputy speaker of the parliament, a fantastic guy who did, even though he had somewhat anti-Semitic sentiments, he, he did whatever he could to save the Jews and they were saved. Metropolitan Stefan, Metropolitan Cyril, the, the leaders of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, they all pitched in to save the Jews of Bulgaria. But the Nazis had given Macedonia and Thrace as a present to the Bulgarians for joining them to fight against the Soviets. And in those two, two places, in, in, in the Macedonia, 7,700 Jews, in Thrace, some 3,000 Jews, altogether 11,343 Jews were deported by the Bulgarians to Treblinka. Almost no one returned. That's a classic example. This is an absolute outrage. And believe me, we're doing whatever we can to fight against these lies. And that's just one small example in Bulgaria, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine is a terrible offender, Croatia, Belarus, mm. Poland, of course, goes right to Romania, Hungary. Almost every single country in Eastern Europe lies about the Holocaust and especially about the role of their local Nazi collaborators. Mm. I just, I just want to say something. Maybe you know, it, it's important to to explain what what their goals are. One of the things they want to do is to create a false symmetry between Nazi crimes and, and communist crimes, and to claim that communist crimes are just as bad as Nazi crimes. They should be treated the same, and that they're genocide. Now, if that's true, which it isn't, that means that Jews committed genocide. Now, if Jews committed genocide, how can Jews complain about what the genocide that they committed? If a country has a, has a choice between being a country of victims or a country of perpetrators, it's a no-brainer. Of course they want to be a country of victims to emphasize their own suffering. So unfortunately, the victims of communism never got the recognition and compensation that they deserve. So they feel that this is a card to use. And the result is that they try and minimize the Holocaust, certainly their role in the house. They don't deny, by the way, they don't deny that the Holocaust took place. They just changed the narrative. What's the Holocaust? Nazis came to our country and murdered our Jews. And the other thing is that some of their heroes are people who fought against the Soviets, which is understandable. After, words, after the war, they fought against the Soviets. But what do you do if, one of these, if some of these people murdered Jews during the Holocaust? In theory, that should automatically disqualify them from being national heroes. How can you be a national hero if you murdered your neighbors just because they were Jews? So, and they are now pushing for a joint Memorial Day for all the victims of totalitarian regimes, which would make International Holocaust Day, of course, superfluous. Um, I have two questions, but I just wanna quickly go to the one Tali just posted now, she, saying in light of what you said now, what do you think about how Germany is facing its past? Ay, ay, okay, that's about uh, five lectures worth, at least. So let's just say this, in certain respects, Germany has done uh, a, a very uh, serious job in explaining to the population their guilt, 
taking upon responsibility, but in certain aspects, it's been a disaster. And the, the main disaster has been in terms of justice. The German judiciary refused to adopt the new categories of criminality that were created in Nuremberg, crimes against humanity, crimes against peace. There's a wonderful book written by Lawrence Douglas about the Demian Yuk trial called The Right Wrong Man. And in other words, uh, Nazi war criminals were tried in Germany until recently, according to an 1870 Prussian statute, which made it very, very difficult to convict people. And I'll give you an example. Until 1985, from 49, when West Germany took over the legal system in what had been the American and British zones of Germany, until 1985, there were 200,000 investigations, 120,000 indictments, less than 7,000 convictions. And, and the, in some cases, the, the, the verdicts were laughable, not laughable, criable, I should say, just that with no proportion to the crimes of those people who served in places like Treblinka and the Einsatzgruppen. And then um, there's a question that has been waiting for a long time. So it's from Fahad, no, Fawad Javad. And he's saying, looks like religious anti-Semitism is not unique to our Muslim societies alone. Shall welcome ideas on dealing with it. He will welcome any ideas on dealing with it. Uh, we would need about uh, a couple of years to be able to answer that question. Uh, this has plagued us from, for thousands of years already, or 2,000 years, basically. That is, is plagued us, in other words, the Jewish people. And it, uh, it uh, you know, it, it, initially it was religious, then it became racial during the Nazi period. Now it's political, anti-Zionism. This is something that has accompanied us through our entire history. And all our, I'm saying, we've devoted certainly, I mean, countless, countless resources, countless hours and, and uh, some of the best people, not only Jews, non-Jews, people from all walks of life had devoted their lives to teaching the Holocaust. And I see my, my friend and colleague, Pera Rudling here on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the webinar and other people, and they're doing fabulous things. But the lies persist. And, and this, this, this is, I mean, people are dedicating their lives to this. And uh, we have such people, and thank God we have such people. And as a result of that, we've educated millions of people about the Holocaust and in, cert in a certain sense, inoculated many of them against anti-Semitism. But it's not a total solution. In other words, it's not a, a vaccine that can, that can, inocul that can immu immunize every single person. And with, with crises throughout the world, whether it's COVID or it's uh, economic crisis or political crises, People looking for scapegoats, you know what they say about the Jews. The Jews are always the first, but never the last. Mm. Wow. Um, we, we are sort of running out of time, but there are, I'll, maybe I'll take one or two more questions just before we close. Um, so Luke is asking, how do you feel about Putin's cronies supporting outright anti-Semites? great book called The Road to Unfreedom by Snyder. One second, one second. again, the end of the question, um, Mendel? Uh, so how do you feel about Putin's crony supporting outright anti-Semites? And then he's, uh, he's saying there's a great book called The Road to Unfreedom by Snyder. Uh, first of all, I haven't read the book. You're talking about the Snyder who wrote Bloodlands, the same Snyder? Yes. I haven't, I haven't read it, I don't know. Listen, obviously Putin is a problem, and, but, uh, but it's a mixed bag. Let's, let's put it this way. The situation of the Jews living in Russia today is far better than it was during the Soviet times, because in the Soviet times, the anti-Semitism was government inspired and funded and promoted. Here, it's not, it's, that's not what's happening. Actually, Putin, has some sort of empathy for Jews for various personal reasons. 
But the problem, the problem is they're meddling in the Middle East and, and their own uh, you know, ambitions uh, in, in, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Mm. And then someone is also asking, considering the fact that 90% of Lithuanian Jewry were murdered, Sugihara's intervention is greatly amplified. Have you interviewed Sugihara's son? And how does the Lithuanian government treat Sugihara's legacy? Okay, this is one of the biggest bluffs in, in, in Holocaust history. The Jews whom Sugihara saved were not Lithuanian Jews. They were Polish refugees who escaped from Eastern Poland and Western Poland to Lithuania when the Russians turned, turned Vilnius or Vilna over to the independent quasi-democratic country of Lithuania. Okay. The Lithuanian Jews were not allowed out of the Soviet Union. Later, the Soviets occupied Lithuania in 1940. And when Sugihara gave the transit visas, and, and listen, you have to mention Svartendik, the Dutch consul, Decker, the Dutch ambassador, uh, the young in Stockholm, they all made available these, these end visas to Curaçao. And then the, the Sugihara visas became important. And of course, we super appreciate what, uh, what Sempo Sugihara did. As a matter of fact, I just, just had an exchange of emails with Nobuki, his son, whom I know, terrific guy. But, uh, but this is, the, the whole thing in Lithuania is they're trying to deflect attention from their crimes. Sugihara had nothing to do with Lithuania. He just happened to be there. And he was sent there to be a spy for Japanese military intelligence because they, the Japanese were suspicious about the... Um, about their allies, their German allies, and they wanted to know when they're going to attack the Soviet Union. And Lithuania was the most convenient listening point for him, and he was for military intelligence, Sugihara. But in any event, the people who were the beneficiaries were only Polish refugees. Not, there were very few Lithuanian Jews who were able to get out on the basis of Curaçao visas and, and Japanese transit visas. Mm. But this Lithuania is the same machinations, you know, try and, uh, you know, if you go to Ponar, which is a place where 100,000 people were murdered, 70,000 Jews, you see a picture of Sugihara. What does Sugihara have to do with that? Nothing, but everyone knows Sugihara. So, wow, he must be a Lithuanian righteous, but <laughs> a Japanese Lithuanian or something. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Well, um... We do have uh, one more question, but I'm going to close um, the session. Dr. Ifram Zurov, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your knowledge and for having such an amazing ability to just speak to us. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thanks, Endo. I thank appreciate you. it. Um, there is a recording of this webinar that will be available uh, on our YouTube uh, channel. So if, if people still have more questions that unfortunately could not be answered or just comments, uh, the recording of this webinar is available. Um, Tali, is there anything you'd like to say just in closing? Just to, to thank you, Ephraim, for, for sharing your, your uh, amazing knowledge and enriching us uh, with uh, many of the, the challenges and uh, uh, successes and we look very much forward to to more and to learn more there were questions for example about western europe or in, or about greece or about france and uh, uh just to whet, whet everyone's appetite for the next part of the series okay thank, Ephraim will share thank you us. very much i also want to thank my relatives who are in the audience especially the ones in joburg and in cape town and, uh, and other friends like Per Anders Rudling, Valdis Yunis, uh, Eva Odrashinsky, and Pete Kessel, and uh, Ilana Dreyer, of course. Um, and uh, hope to see you soon with another lecture. Thank you. Um, Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So for more information to, to, for more information on Dr. Zurov's books, uh, one of which we've spoken about today. Um, we will put a link that will enable you to, to have more information as to how to purchase those books. But you can follow Dr. Zurov on Twitter at 
E Zurov, which is a capital letter E, capital letter Z. Uh, so that's E Zurov. And then on Facebook, Ephraim Zurov. Um, and then join us next time, uh, next Tuesday. Our next webinar will be next Tuesday on the 8th of, of June. And it's the Anne Frank and her surprising global legacy. So join us for that uh, next week. Good morning, good night, good evening, goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us.